Okay. So very good evening, everyone. I just need an interactive audience. So can I have some hands up for anyone who knows about Holang Lavaj? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, so 2023 started with a bang, and uh, we had two superstars from Hyderabad. The first in RRR got the Golden Globe, and second is we are having Broncos. So here you can see that's Junior NTR. He's super excited to be at the Golden Globes, and that's me, and I'm super excited to be at Broncos. So how many of you agree that Broncos is the best event for interventional pulmonology? Can I have hands up? Yeah. So now that I have your attention, I'll be starting on uh, whole lung lavage in PAP. I won't be focusing much on the pathophysiology of PAP, but definitely how the procedure is done. My effort is by the end of the presentation, you will be able to go back and try and attempt a procedure by yourself. So what do you feel is the first and most important thing that you need to do when you are doing a whole lung lavage? So the most important thing is you need to assemble a team. This is one procedure which cannot be done just by the interventional pulmonologist. You need a complete team. You need a physiotherapist who has a lot of power, uh, a lot of strength. You need an anesthetist who's very skillful as well as can be good to look at. So this is what your team is supposed to be. So basically that's how you assemble a team for your whole lung lavage. So the history says that whole lung lavage was uh, there since the 1950s. Uh, Benjamin Castleman found a patient who was passed positive for proteinaceous material. And then 1958, uh, there was a, pub a report published on uh, PAP itself. Then 1963, Dr. Uh, Jose Ramirez Rivera at Baltimore repeated the installation of normal saline by a transtracheal plastic catheter positioned in one lung at a time. And 1964, this was improvised with a double lumen tube. So basically what we see is there's an impaired, impaired surfactant metabolism and leading to accumulation in the alveoli of proteinaceous material, which is rich in surfactant protein. And there can be GM-CSF antibodies uh, problematic, causing pathogenic mechanism, which might lead to congenital acquired autoimmune and secondary form of uh, PAP itself. So this is how you see the pathophysiology on the microscope. Management for congenital autoimmune and secondary has been uh, uh, put in, in a table form here, wherein the patient, if he has mild, you can observe the patient. But eventually, when the patient progresses, you need to go for a lung lavage. So various indications that we see for whole lung lavage, this has been a study from 20 worldwide centers. So whole lung lavage has been the gold standard for treatment of PAF. Uh, usually, you, we need to do this when there's a declining lung function, declining oxygenation, and radiographic worsening. Uh, preferred interval, center to center varies, but a three-week interval is good between two different lungs. You need to follow all your bronchoscopy and BAL guidelines. You need a good team of nursing, anesthesiology, respiratory therapist, physiotherapist, and an interventional pulmonary uh, person. And you, have, you need to do it under general anesthesia. Equipments required is your flexible bronchoscope, pref, uh, preferably a pediatric scope, which can go through the double lumen tube. Warm saline, Y circuit, suction catheters, double lumen tube, warming blanket. So it is advisable that pre-procedure you get a PFT done, get a FRC of the patient known so that you know how much uh, volume is to be instilled. Uh, for the involved lung, you can go ahead with uh, a VQ scan, but an HRCT is sufficient. Then 50 liter of saline is to be kept at body temperature, that is 37 degree. And the reservoir has to be 50 centimeter above the uh, patient's level, and you need a Y adapter. What we use here is a 
uh, Y adapter that is used by the urology doctors. So there is a debate, uh, debate on what decubitus to use. So if you go for the lavage dependent lung, this will minimize the risk of spillage to the opposite side, and there, but the problem is there is higher ventilation perfusion mismatch in an already severely hypoxic patient. If you put the lavage lung on the non-dependent side, on the upper side, the advantage uh, is to minimize the blood flow to the non-ventilating lung and less VQ mischarge. Problem here is you might have more instances of spillage from the uh, lavage lung to the non-lavage lung. In our experience, we've always kept the lavage lung as the non-dependent one on the upper side. And if there's any spillage seen, you can always reposition your DLT and uh, do suction of the opposite lung with a pediatric bronchoscope. So this is how the Y connector look, looks. Uh, the one which is normally available is the TURP connector. And uh, one end of the Y connector will be attached uh, in, uh, inside the target lung. One will be connected to the saline bag and one will be connected to the drainage catheter. You need to monitor your patient during the procedure for ECG, uh, arterial oxygen saturation, uh, blood pressure, ABG analysis, and uh, you need to check for the oxygen levels. The surprising part here is oxygen levels drop as the lavage lung is emptied. So whenever you are expecting that the fluid is flowing out and the oxygen should go up, surprisingly that is the time when your SpO2 levels of the patient really fall down. So you need to just be prepared for that. So you intubate the patient, you pay, keep the patient in a supine position, put a vest on the patient's chest because you need to perform physiotherapy. The physiotherapy goes on for at least three to five minutes per session. This is very tiring for the physiotherapist herself or himself. And at the same time, it can cause some contusion to the patient also. That's why the vest is important. It is said that both for the left lung and the right lung, you should use the left-sided DLT. This is because the right-sided DLT might miss the opening of the right upper lobe. But in my personal experience, what I've seen is when you use the left-sided DLT for the right lung lavage, you might not be able to collect the return fluid as well as you can use with the right uh, DLT. So depending on the patient-to-patient -patient basis, you can use the left for the left and the right for the right. Or for the safer side, you can always keep the left DLT for both the lungs. You need a bronchoscope to confirm the position of the tube for the check uh, leaking, if you have to check for the leak, you that's what you do. You ventilate each lung separately. And while uh, venting the non-ventilated lung in the saline water seal cap, you can see if there's any bubbling or not. So that shows if there's any leak or not. So here you can see this is a severely affected lung in Lavat initially. First denitrogenation is performed wherein ventilation of both the lungs with FiO2 of uh, 1 for 15 minutes is done and then you let the degassing happen for uh, both the lungs and then under gravity the saline flows into your target lung and we have to repeat these cycles with filling of approximately 500 to 1000 cc warm saline till you get a clear fluid in return. That's uh, manual percussion and mechanical percussion being performed. Uh, you can choose to do it for two minutes or three minutes, depending on how fast the patient might get hypoxic. And you need to use a blanket or a cover so that the patient does not get contusion because of the physiotherapy. Now, once you are done with the physiotherapy, you basically clamp the uh, pipe which is bringing in the fluid and you open the clamp for the draining fluid and this is what you see comes out. You don't need any suction or anything, it's the gravity which works and you can see that the fluid is coming out. You need to monitor the input and output. Anytime when there is a difference of more than 1000 cc, there might be a leakage into the contralateral lung and that's when you need to intervene with your pediatric bronchoscope. You need to continue this till you find a clear fluid. There are different variations which have been uh, mentioned uh, in literature. So people have performed bilateral sequential lung lavage. So you perform the right lung and the left lung in the same seating, but it does not have any great advantage. On the contrary, they have seen that there, are, there is a higher risk of patient getting hypoxic. 
patient have uh, people have performed the procedure uh, in supine and different uh, procedures there's uh, one technique wherein the lung is partially filled drained after filling with saline and then ventilated with peep of 5 to 10 uh, centimeter and one other option is if you can afford to put your patient on ecmo you can do the procedure with ecmo itself so this is the drain that comes out and you actually can notice the sediments are decreasing with each and every bottle so post procedure you need to actively suction out any remaining fluid which might there uh, might be there in the lung you need to ventilate both the lungs and consider extubation or reintubation with a single lumen tube if the patient is still hypoxemic diuretics can be useful because there is a lot of fluid which is not now available for you to drain out or suction and you need to do a chest x-ray post procedure complications that you might come across is fever hypoxia wheezing patients might land up in pneumonia fluid leakage pleural effusion pneumothorax but I would say the most uh, common complication is a patient goes hypoxic, you just need to abandon the procedure. You have to keep a sharp eye on the SpO2 levels and there might be leakage in the opposite lung. You might uh, see it in your first or second case and the only best thing you can do is you can go in with the pediatric bronchoscope. There are different other therapies which are supportive with the whole lung lavage. So, there was local GMCSF which we were giving till now, but right now it's not been available since COVID in India. So that's when we started giving rituximab. So there are different antibiotics and all which can be given other than the gold standard itself. So I'll just take you through a case, 65 year old female with breathlessness for the past one year. This uh, lady did not have any past history. She was uh, referred to us with a history that uh, her bronchoscopy was already performed and the bronchoscopic fluid was completely clear. So they were pretty sure that it's not a pap. So we saw that the CT was very much indicative of uh, pap. You can see the crazy paving uh, pattern involving the bilateral lungs. And that's when we went for a transbronchial lung cryobiopsy. Since we could not have gone for a whole lung lavage, since there was a written document that the previous bronchoscopy showed complete clear fluid on return. So this is what was there on the lung cryobiopsy and uh, that's when we decided to go ahead with the whole lung lavage. So this is demonstration of the fluid draining from the saline back to the lung via control circuit. So this will be connected to the bronchial limb of the double lumen tube and you also need to check if the water uh, column is filling of the lung with any saline fluid. So you check on the water column, if it goes up then you have to stop the amount of fluid that is going inside. This is for the right lung. The physiotherapists are trying to uh, get every part of the lung involved. So we went with the lateral decubitus also. So this completely depends on the comfort of your anesthetist, how much your anesthetist is comfortable with the patient changing positions with the DLT being inside. Here you can see how the sequential uh, return of fluid actually changes color. Mind you, this was a four hour long procedure. This was after around 6 litres of drain. Now you can see that it's almost clear. So this is the sequence where you can actually see that the sediments are uh, settling and the fluid is going clear. This is the video for this particular case. Yeah, sorry. 
Yeah, so here you can see the difference. So the right on top is before the patient underwent whole lung lavage. That was after the left one and that was after performing both the lungs. So vast improvement in the CT scan as well as the clinical condition of the patient and uh, in the spirometry result also, you can uh, measure it on the ABG itself. So the take home message is, uh, PAP is the first line of therapy. It needs to be done at specialized centers. A good understanding of anesthesiology is uh, required. A respiratory therapist, physiotherapist, a bronchoscopist uh, come up together. You need careful planning and execution, and you need to optimize the safety and efficacy of the procedure. So our experience has been with eight patients. We have done 17 lavage procedures. All lavage procedures, the uh, non-dependent lung was used for lavage and they were performed in supine position. Six patients were given anti-GMCSF, two patients in post-COVID were given rituximab. So I think so, I have left you prepared for... Avengers! Assemble. No! So you need to assemble your team and I hope I did my job well in helping you with that. Those are my references and as they say, uh, go alone if you wish to go faster but go with your people if you wish to go longer. So that's um, the intervention pulmonology family. Lot of us now with every year bronchus happening and more and more people joining in. So lot of us are on the phone. A lot of times I'm inside the patient with a rigid bronchoscope and I'm calling up Hari. I've uh, called up Professor Gasprini and we are discussing what to do next. So uh, very cohesive uh, family there, my guide and mentor, Professor Gasprini. Thank you uh, for giving me the time.